Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. We're here today thanks to the, um, the generosity of Booz Allen. Accelerate today's te missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Well, we're joined today by a very special guest. Um, she's got a wonderful new book out that traces the history of women in the U.S. Navy. And we were privileged to be able to excerpt that book in the current March-April issue of Naval History Magazine. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And I furthermore hope that it will be the springboard for you to look at this whole book because it's quite a great exhaustive um, survey of this very important aspect of the modern history of the Navy. Randy Gogan retired in 2010 after 32 years of Naval service. She was a longtime historian at the Office of Naval Intelligence, and she's here to, to discuss today her book, From Yeomanettes to Fighter Gents, A Century of Women in the U.S. Navy. Randy, thank you for joining us. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. So this is, a, um, I would say, kind of an overdue book. Uh, it's a very well done when Naval Institute Press published it. I think they did a beautiful uh, a job on it. It's a beautiful looking book. And it's just um, packed full of um, a very interesting, uh, it's a history of the ad women's advancement in the Navy and the resistance they often faced. Um, it's also kind of a social history, if you will, of the evolving Navy um, through the 20th century and all the epochal events of that. Um, and it seems like if there's an underwriting theme to this, it's the uh, cultural hurdles stood in the way of the pragmatically obvious, brilliant idea of augmenting the force with this great resource, which is uh, the population of females in the United States, half the U.S. population. We live in an age where it's hard to imagine the armed forces without um, women and men and every you know everybody. Um, but it's the resistance that it faces along the way seems to be a recurring theme throughout this. Now, why don't we start, instead of starting at the very beginning of uh, Women in the Navy, we'll start with the excerpt from the magazine, which looks at the um, struggle to get the waves established for World War II and how this is supposed to be temporary, but it quickly became evident to the post-war Navy that we can't go back to the way we did things and still function. So... Um, Anyway, uh, if you care to uh, expound on that, um, one thing that was interesting to me and new to me from uh, reading your work was uh, the origin of the name WAVES, uh, Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, itself is sort of a, the, the parsing of that uh, title is very much a conscious thing. Um, so I find that kind of telling of the whole theme of it all. Yes, that was... Um... Elizabeth Barnard, who was a professor of English at uh, um, Elizabeth Reynard, a professor of English at Barnard College, um, who came up with the term. And she said, you know, I played around with the letters and then I came up with the word emergency because it would be a comfort to the admirals to know that we weren't supposed to be around for keeps. Right. Um, so so there was such a there was such a resistance to this that the idea was, well, in the exigencies of wartime, okay, we'll accept um, this support that the Navy needs at this point, but we must stress that it's very much supposed to be a temporary wartime measure. Um, and it it took that sort of political minutiae to get this through. Um, the the army had gone through this first, right? Um, there. Um, getting their uh, women's service passed through Congress. And uh, the Navy kind of learned from that rocky experience a little bit, did they not? Well, what's interesting about that is in the interwar period, the Army actually had students at the War College in the D1 course um, do studies about how to utilize women in war. And... With only one exception, most of these studies emphasized, you know, we have to we have to figure this out now because women are going to pressure us to come into the army, and we have to figure out how to keep them out. You know, we want we want them to have a civilian 
in a civilian status, an auxiliary status, but we do not want them in the army. And so the bill that they introduced, that was the objective. It was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. So they didn't have military status. And that would that would turn out to create a lot of problems for them. And they'd eventually, in 1943, drop it. And they give women permanent status because it was just too much of a headache. They couldn't manage the organization as auxiliary. Um, right. So when the Army introduced their bill, the Navy officials said to them, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to watch. So we think you're going to get clobbered. And we're going to sit back and see how it goes. And it did meet a great deal of opposition, even, even the auxiliary bill. A lot of it was bipartisan opposition in Congress. Um, people claimed that it was going to humiliate American men and degrade American womanhood. And um, so it took a great deal of convincing, but they did get the support of uh, um, George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, and um, uh, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War. Right, right. Yeah, so, Marshall was instrumental in uh, finally realizing, uh, you know, realistically, this is something that is of extreme value at this dire moment for us to do. Um, there was resistance within the Navy as well. Let's talk about that. Where, where, what was the, what, do you, what would you think is the root source for that resistance? Um, it's largely a cultural resistance. Well, yeah, it was, well, um, Congresswoman Edith North Rogers contacted Admiral Nimitz, who was the chief of the Bureau of Personnel at the time. And she said, you know, I've introduced this bill for the Army, so you want me to do something similar for the Navy? And Nimitz was like, no thanks, we're good. Um, he was pretty skeptical. And most of the most of the Navy bureaucracy had the same attitude. He actually conducted a poll of all the various bureaus and offices, and they all pretty much came back with no thanks, with the exception of the Bureau of Aeronautics and the Office of Chief of Naval Operations. Both those organizations said, Yeah, we you know. We take women if you if you know they get they get enlisted, so um, it wasn't a total opposition, but mm -hmm. those two offices had more experience in in terms of aeronautics. Um, River Admiral Towers, who um, was the chief of the bureau, he he knew that women were working in the civil aviation industry. He said, okay, we've got all these women, they're experienced, they know what they're doing. We would be stupid, you know, not to bring them into the Navy. And for the Office of Chief of Naval Operations, um, they were more concerned with administrative type of tasks and mm -hmm. they could see the value of having women. Mm -hmm. Those who resisted it, what what do you think it was? They figured it would be um the logistics of it would be complicated or is it just a cultural um, get your back up kind of thing? I know there was always a lot of, it's not unusual in the Navy for this resistance in the face of an, uh, a good idea. Like uh, it's remarkable when you look back at how there was such a resistance from going from sail to steam. And some of it came down to things like the sheer aesthetics of it. <laughs> the, the officer corps figured, well, these things are ugly. Sailing warships are beautiful. Um, and there are other excuses always like the, it's it'll erode training, you know, all the everybody working in concert on a sailing ship and all that. But so this well, isn't the first time you see resistance to um, an inevitable idea. Um, but I'm curious about yeah. about sort of the underlying reasons for that. Um, and this might get back to the earlier chapters of your book really um so maybe let's dive back to the beginning and go forward from there <laughs> um they first well, entered the war as yeomanettes why don't we talk about that right. um status as service and what years we're talking about there okay so this is 1917 the united states enters world war one and 
there's immediately an intense competition, especially in Washington, across the government for skilled clerical workers. And Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels looks at the language of the Naval Reserve Act of 1925, and it says that membership in the Naval, Naval Reserve is open to citizens of the United States. It's not qualified by gender. It just says mm-hmm. citizens. So he says, ha, here's a loophole. Mm-hmm. So he says, let's go ahead, go ahead, let's enlist women. And the Marine Corps came to him a few months later and since they fall administratively under the Department of the Navy. Although if you say that to a Marine, they'll get hackles up. Um, he, you know, the they asked him if they could enlist women, too, and they ended up enlisting about 300 um, during the course of the war. So the thing that shocked me was why would he even think of this, knowing what the prevailing cultural norms were at the time? Well, his wife happened to be a leader of the women's suffrage movement. Oh, there you was, go. She was close friends with Cherry Carrie Chapman Catt, who was the founder of the League of Women Voters and another suffrage leader. So that undoubtedly had some influence on mm-hmm. his thinking. But ultimately, it was just pure pragmatism. You know, right. the Navy needed skilled clerical workers. And by offering women the opportunity to enlist, you know, they flocked to Washington um, because they were patriotic and they wanted to do their part. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then they, if they had military status, the Navy had much more control over their utilization than if they mm-hmm. had just tried. And the other problem was with the civil service, it just, this may sound familiar, trying to hire people for the civil service took too long. And uh, you know, cost too much, cost too much, and the civil service wages were not that good, so it was hard for them to attract people. Mm-hmm. So the army resented what Daniels did. First of all, because the army had tried so hard to you know keep women out of the ranks, and they didn't like the precedent he was setting. But you know the army official said, well, you know. He needed clerks and he got them. You know, it was kind of like dirty pool. Um, but they weren't about to do the same thing because of their own prejudices. Mm-hmm. Well, being married to a, a member of the suffrage movement, um, that clearly uh, helped um, pave the way for this to happen. What about uh, the drawdown after World War One? What happened to those women who had served in the Navy? service during the war what happens to them at that point well they um within about six months or so after the end of the war most of them are gone because congress um passes an act in 1919 which basically says um civilians um, women should not or actually something to the effect of um, members of the Naval Reserve will not be ordered to perform active duty on shore of a kind which is ordinarily performed by civilians. So they don't specifically say we don't want women, but that's what it's a very roundabout way of saying that. But because the work they were, yeah, the work they were doing was clerical and Mm -hmm. So that was the, that was the first shot across the bow, and then in 1925, Congress um, revised the Naval Reserve Act to say that enlistment was open to male citizens of the United States. So they uh-huh. closed the loophole that they they sure had, did. had used, <laughs> and you know they thought, okay, problem solved. We don't have right. to worry about this anymore. Well, this this that kind of um those kind of cultural barriers make more sense to me in 1917 than to do in 1941. Yet the thing that happened in the interim, of course, is that women got the right to vote. So by the eve of World War II, we have women Congress uh, persons and um, 
And so there, there is a movement in Capitol Hill. There's support on Capitol Hill to um, get women back in the naval force uh, as World War II takes off. And that's a big part of this story too, isn't it? Uh, the battles mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill, not just the battles within the service. Yeah, that's and I I love a good legislative fight. We see several of them over the course of the history. Um, it, this is one of the one of the first big ones. But what makes it so interesting is there's a very eclectic cast of characters involved. Um, you have well Frank Knox is the Secretary of the Navy, and he supported the idea from the outset. Um, and then you had John Towers, who I mentioned previously, chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics. He had been pushing this for a long time. So he was for it. Um, there, were, um, there was a civilian advisory council comprised of uh, prominent women. Many of them were uh, leaders of women's colleges or co-educational institutions who were advising the um, chief of naval personnel and two of those members had kind of worked a back channel with first lady eleanor roosevelt when the, when the bill got stuck the bureau the budget wouldn't release it they contacted mrs roosevelt and said you know could you put the word in with franklin which she did she did that a lot on a lot of things um mm. and he came back and said, told the Secretary of the Navy, go ahead and do it the way that you see fit. And they finally got it out. I um, got it out of uh, budget jail. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, there were also um, Congressman Melvin Maas of Minnesota. He was a um, colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve. And he had three daughters. One of his daughters would become a lieutenant colonel herself later on. Um, but he took the bill and introduced it in the House. And he kind of championed the bill on the House side. And then Senator Raymond Willis, who was from Indiana, sponsored it in the Senate. And the thing that the connection between all these all these guys is a Chinese-American surgeon named Dr. Margaret Chung, also known as Mom Chung. And she's a really interesting person. She, um, she was very, um, after the Japanese had invaded Manchuria, she had, um, she had campaigned on behalf of, you know, helping uh, the Chinese people. And so she got, in, she got interested and things military, and she had this this really elaborate social social network that she built up, and it included um, members of government, it included celebrities, um, all kinds of different people, and so she had personal relationships with a lot of these people, and she lobbied them um, because, and the reason she did that was because she, as a surgeon. She hoped that she would be able to get a commission and serve as a surgeon in the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, for everything that she did for the Navy, she never got that chance, which was unfortunate. But she was a really, really fascinating person. Yeah, she emerges as sort of an unsung um, champion of this uh, and a very in important one as well. Um, so it's good to see her get her due in the pages of your book. I was also um, kind of interested to see that it wasn't, uh, it didn't really fall along obvious sort of political lines, the political divide in America, that among the Congresswomen um, that were supporting of this, uh, you have a mix of Republicans, Democrats. Um, so it wasn't like one side or the other tried to railroad this through. There's a bipartisan support, even though there's a larger maybe cultural um, standing against it. There was a bipartisan, this was a bipartisan effort. And I think that gives mm -hmm. it a little more gravitas um, in terms of when it finally the, happened. The, the opposition was extremely bipartisan. <laughs> um, the opposition the was bipartisan yeah. too. Yes, it was. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, this is such a classic example of something like this where 
there's a, a knee-jerk sort of resistance to it. It just, well, that's just not the way things have ever been, right? But once um, the practical situation, the existential moment necessitates it, it quickly proves that this is a logical, objective thing to do. Now, by the peak of the war, the D the D.C., the National Capital Region is just swollen with the ranks of uh, women serving in the Navy and all these various capacities. Um, it's quite an uh, amazing number of them. Um, yeah. The, um, what are some of the things they especially shown in? Uh, we touched on some of that in your excerpt as well. Right. Uh, well, um, there were 80, 86,000 women total serving um, by 1945. And... So 86,000, 55% of them were in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty amazing. It was very crowded. Um, that tells 70, me, I'm sorry, let me just quickly interject no, this. Ahead. That tells me right there that the Navy Department at the height of World War II at its nerve center in Washington couldn't have run without this um, this valuable pool of resources. I mean... How could they have operated? That those sheer numbers um, tell you everything you need to know. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what were some of the um, departments they especially um, were uh, adept at and proved their worth in? Well, um, one of them was I mentioned the Office of Chief of Naval Operations, and um, when the first graduates. Um, came, you know, came out of training. Um, uh, one of the representatives for the chief of personnel started making a walk, walk around at the Navy Department, trying to see if he can get any people to take these women on. And he uh, talks to Captain Henry Smith Hutton, who is the um, intelligence officer for Comage. And he says, I've got these women, you know, they're, they're women's college graduates and, you know, you know, we're looking to put them to work and could you use them? And he had been to several offices already where he just got this, you know, cold look and like, no, thanks. We're good. Um, and Hutton said, sure, I'll take them, you know, give me as many as you've got. And the guy was so shocked. <laughs> He's like, you are the first person I've spoken to. And it turned out that the women performed so well that by the end of the war, they were completely running the submarine plotting room. The only men who were there, there were two officers um, who couldn't go to sea for medical reasons. But everybody else, everybody else in, the, in, the, in their plot were women. And of course, women were also um, involved with radio communications, and they played a big part in um, building the, uh, not building in terms of designing, but actually physically putting together the um, decryption machines called the bomb devices. Right. And then they operated them. Um, and those, those things ran 24 7. Mm -hmm. And it was Waves who were, you know, who were running them. So um, when the war ends, the original idea was this was only for volunteers for emergency services, a temporary measure. Were there those in, um, in the Navy when the war ended that, that saw, okay, we need to cut this off now? And what changed their mind in terms of uh, the emerging Cold War and the, the great value that this human resource had proven uh, during the war? Well, first of all, you had Operation Magic Carpet, where they were trying to bring home these millions of soldiers who were, you know, had been serving overseas. And you can't do that without the machinery, you know, without the administrative people to process them all. And so they couldn't really demo they couldn't demobilize the women like they did at the end of World War One and say, okay, thanks, go home now. They needed them there to help get the guys home. And, and then of course you have the onset of the Cold War, and now it's looking at uh, the threat of a expansionist communist regime. 
and the possibility of nuclear war. So we're going to have to be able to mobilize very rapidly. So now having women makes sense because you want to have this trained nucleus of women who you can then use when the balloon goes up to, to bring all the other people on board and get them up to speed. So right. that's where the idea originates. Mm -hmm. um, and when they finally um, sort of capitulate to the reality of this and women are allowed to serve going forward post-war, uh, does the rank structure open up a little bit? Um, do they kind of uh, make it like you can get higher in your ranks in, uh, during World War II? How did that evolve? Yeah, that actually, I think it opened up even a little bit before the end of the war because it was so unrealistic. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. the initial plan for the post-war organization was just to have a women's reserve component, you know, in the peacetime Navy. Mm -hmm. in, in, but the second director of the waves, Captain Jean Palmer, this is pretty gutsy. I don't know if she had clearance to do this, but she's testifying in Congress and she says, you know, the Secretary of the Navy is saying, oh, we don't care how we have them just as long as we have them. And she gets up there and says, no, she goes, they don't want, they don't want to come into this, you know, you call them up, disrupt their lives, you know, and you, you drag them in there and then you just cut them loose when it's convenient for you. You know, they don't have a career path. You're, it doesn't make any sense. They don't want to be in the reserve component. They want to be in the regular Navy. And um, Margaret J. Smith, who is on the Naval Affairs Committee, says, yeah, yeah, she's right. You know, either the, you, the Navy either needs these women or they do not. And you've got to make up your mind. So she, um, she introduces a bill to give women permanent status in the regular Navy. And this sets up the next exciting legislative fight. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking late forties now, correct? Yeah, this is where it's right around mm -hmm. 47, 48. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, once that, uh, that battle is won as well, um, a beachhead has been established. Mm -hmm. Women in the Naval force. But the battle continues uh, th through the ensuing decades. Uh, what are some benchmarks along the way? I mean, it, it all involves opening up different aspects of the service to women serving in them. And um, it's like each one is another sort of miniature victory on the road to women in full service in the Navy. How does, let's talk about that sort of trajectory a little bit going forward from say like the fifties to the seventies mm -hmm. and eighties when things really seem to start to move in that direction right. even more so. Well, with the um, Women's Armed Services Integration Act in 1948, which is what Smith championed, um, that carried over a compromise that was made back in 1941, um, where they said, okay, if you're gonna have women in the Navy, you have to have a statute on the books that says they cannot go to sea, they cannot serve on ships, except for medical personnel assigned to hospital ships or transports. So that carries over into the 1948 legislation. And so that basically cuts women out of the main reason for the existence of the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, makes it really hard to show how you're relevant when you can't even, you know, you can't set foot on a ship. So that, that's a big obstacle. And that, that's the obstacle for like the next 40 years, mm -hmm. trying to get past that. Um, and when is it that women are, are um, it's, they open up service on board ships beyond the medical role to women? What, what rough period of time are we talking here? Now, if we're getting into the 1970s, and this is, um, this is after the Vietnam War and the uh, draft comes to an end, and then they establish the all-volunteer force. Mm 
that's in 73, in the year before, Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment. But it doesn't become law until it's ratified by, I think it's 38 states. So it goes to the states for ratification. But at the time, several states, you know, ratified it right away. And so everybody assumed, oh, this is on a glide path. Um, this is going to happen. And so we have to get with the program. So along comes one of the young, the, the youngest chief of naval operations to hold the position at the time, and that's Bud Zumwalt. And he sees this and he goes, okay, we, we're going to get ahead of this. And he issues Z Graham 116, which is his directive on equal opportunity for women in the Navy. And, and he authorized um, the entry of women into all enlisted ratings on a temporary basis. And he also establishes a pilot program to send women to sea on the hospital ship USS Sanctuary. But they're going there. They're going on the ship to actually work as crew. They're not, you know, taking care of patients. They're, they're going to actually crew the ship. And um, he also expands a number of opportunities for women officers as well. So well, this all sounds this all sounds wonderful. But his big one of his biggest opponents is his own assistant chief of naval personnel, who is my absolute favorite person <laughs> in the book. And she she's such a fascinating, fascinating person. Um Commander Robin Quigley. Mm -hmm. And um She's a, she is a staunch institutionalist. She understands the Navy, you know, how it works, how, do you, how you get things done, what the proper bureaucratic procedure is, how resources get managed. She knows the stuff like the back of her hand. And she's looking at this and she's thinking, yeah, this is dumb. Why are you going to open all these ratings to women and there's still the combat exclusion law in place? Where are they going to go? Where, where's the career path for these women? And she also objected to sending women to the Naval Academy for the same reason. Because at the time, the mission of the Naval Academy was to train combat officers. And she still... Why are we going to waste money sending women to Naval Academy? Because they can go to OCS, they can go to NROTC. Um, this, you know, so she had valid reasons, you know, for what for what she said, but it didn't make her popular with Navy women, to mm -hmm. whom, you know, she said, um, "Stop calling yourself Waves. Your that organization went away in 1948." And you're not in a, you're not a ladies auxiliary of the Navy. If you expect to be treated as equals, you have to start acting like it. And she abolished in nine in 1951. They set up the women's representative system, and this was basically chaperone duty. It was a collateral duty for women officers. The kind of it was like an informal chain of command for enlisted women. They had to deal with all their, their problems. It was babysitting. And women officers hated it. They <laughs> didn't want anything to do with it. And so she had bought, actually, that probably won her some points. She got rid yeah. of that. But then the, the, the icing on the cake was she abolished her own job. <laughs> she said, the only reason I have this job is because I looked at all, all my stuff all my functions and she said the only reason i have these is because it's women she said and she sent all the stuff to the different different offices within the navy that handle the same issues for men she said, this, this, there's no point to this you know <laughs> everyone should have the same chain of command and um the new york times actually called her a female chauvinist pig oh. <laughs> I think I personally, I have tremendous respect for her. I mean, she was pretty gutsy to come yes. out 
and say the stuff you did. And actually, I kind of proved her right. You know, there were all kinds of problems were created because the combat exclusion laws were still in place. And there weren't enough billets for these women who had had the impression that they were going to have these, you know, see, you going, it just wasn't going to happen. So mm -hmm. that caused a lot of attrition and disappointment. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she actually got, um, she got another command. She, um, they, because they recognized her talent and uh, it would have been a shame if she had just been forced out. She, uh, they had to work some magic to make it happen, but she, uh, she got the Navy Service Schools Command or something, and that she retired mm -hmm. out of that position. I would imagine even on the deck plates level in the 70s, there was some real sort of cultural adjustments that had to happen here. Um, what about the um, male enlisted sailors? Uh, what was, uh, was there a prevailing attitude among them that we can perceive, or was it just kind of across the board? Um, did they, were they threatened by these sort of uh, rivals for the same billets and whatnot, or did they accept them into well, the crew? You know, it, it, like anything, you know, it, attitudes varied. Um, but one thing that was, was uh, apparent early on was, you know, a lot of the men resented the media attention that the women were getting. Um, you know, because, you know, a woman hauls a line, big whoop, you know, and everyone's mm -hmm. out there taking, you know, and it actually, it, it didn't help the women either, of course, because now mm -hmm. they've got, you have to deal with this resentment and, um, yeah, the media coverage was a real, and that happened again. I mean, it happens repeatedly anytime mm -hmm. women do something different and then the media goes and flocks to that. And um, right. eventually, some people, you know, some women learned um, you just, you know, how to stay away from the cameras <laughs> and the reporters. Right. Because uh, the, 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 the media you know. is like tickled pink that this is happening. They're supportive of it, they're thrilled about it, but mm -hmm. they kind of create more pushback by hyping it to a sense. Right. They don't mean to hype right. it, but that's how it comes off. So that's going on on that level, but uh, the fight to get women in the Naval Academy is proceeding apace as well. Now, that finally happens in 76, I believe, the Correct. first entry class, yes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that battle and how that was finally won. Yeah, well, that's where, um, yeah, Mary Quigley um, was involved. Uh, Robin Quigley, I'm sorry, Robin Quigley um, was involved with that, too. She was testifying before Congress and... Um, one of the congressmen was trying, really putting her on the spot, and um, he kept asking her what her opinion was, and she and she kept repeating the navy, the navy's policy, and he said, "Captain, I am asking you, you know, mm. what do you think?" And that's when she said, "Well, I'm against it," and that's when the New York Times called her a female chauvinist pig. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, yeah, the fight, the fight, um, it was, yeah, the big issue was the academies for training combat officers. So, you know, every, every woman who takes up a space, you're, you're losing that, you know, mm -hmm. potential combat officer. And, you know, the, the problem is, and I, I understood Quigley's position, but also... If you wait around until all the stars are aligned perfectly for something to happen, it is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so they, yeah, it was, it was, that was pretty much the bone of contention. Um, mm -hmm. But also, you know, the tradition, um, a lot of people just didn't like the idea. And actually, as a graduate of a woman's college, I feel I felt like kind of a hypocrite because my college now no longer exists. But um, right before I went down the tubes, they decided to go co-ed, and mm -hmm. that really raised my hackles along with a, you know, a lot of other alumni. And so I can't really fault um, <laughs> you know the male alumni. Like, why are they letting women in? It, it's just kind of a 
I guess we all have our little biases. Um, sure, sure. And, and I, I agree with you on that. I mean, you have to respect people that are resistant to the change of a tradition. I mean, mm -hmm. th their hearts are probably in the right place otherwise. Um, and that's just that's a comfort zone. A tradition is something that you don't want to see upended. Um, but in fact, you're not upending the tradition. You're extending the tradition, really. I mean, if you think right. about it and mm -hmm. you look at the academy today and the completely just like the, the mids today, um, it's there, there's a level of uh, acceptance and equality that's just a given. It's not that, I don't even think they're thinking about it that, that much. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all just mm -hmm. comrades in arms here, it seems like. Um, and of course, it, you look back when this is such a brouhaha and you realize in the fullness of time, it kind of works itself out. But uh, there were, even once that happened, there's still other, there, there keep being more hurdles, right? Like the mm -hmm. first, let's talk about the first women aviators. That was a bit of a um, hurdle as well, was it not? That was sort of a breakthrough. Yeah, they um, opened up aviation non-combat aviation to women in 1972 um but yeah it was a it was it was a slow process to you know to grow to grow women aviators mm -hmm. um because there were so many restrictions on what they could do um mm -hmm. you know if you're a helicopter pilot and you were a woman you could hover over a ship, but you weren't allowed to land on it. So if you're trying to resupply a ship, that kind of makes things makes a problem. Um, what about uh, combat aviation? Um, that was sort of the last one to fall as far as the aviation sphere goes, right? Right. right. Well, they lift the ban on combat aviation, on uh, women in combat aviation. The ban is lifted in 1992. And there's a whole really fascinating fight that goes along with that one that we probably don't have time to uh, go into. But um, so by 1994, they're sending women out to the fleet on carriers. Um, and the problem is the timing for that could not have been worse. Um, a lot of this is post is you know, immediately post tail hook, the big tail hook right. scandal. And there's a huge fallout from that where Secretary of the Navy resigns, uh, she, the CNO resigned, um, all kinds of officers had their careers severely you know, damaged as a result. Um, so there's a lot of you know, angst over that. And then you have these women coming out, you know, coming out to the ships, and they they they, they were signed in October of 1994, and that previous summer was when the big big issue happened between um, Admiral Stanley Arthur and Chief of Naval Operations Border. There was a woman aviation student who complained to her senator. Because, and she claimed that she had been unfairly washed out of flight school because she filed a sexual harassment complaint. Well, the officer who she filed a complaint against was, in fact, punished. Um, and the Secretary of the Navy asked the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Stanley Arthur, who is one of the most respected naval aviators in the service, and he was a, he was an advocate for the integration of women into aviation. So Secretary Navy asked him, hey, will you look at this you know, case? And he did. He, he investigated it and he concluded that you know, she had been given a number of opportunities to you know, correct her deficiencies, but she kept messing up. And you know, she just wasn't cut out to be a pilot. And so that was his decision. He said, you know, sorry. Um, and as a result, her senator placed a hold on um, Admiral Arthur's nomination to assume command of a U.S. Pacific Command, which, as you know, was like the premier, you know, combatant command you, you can have. 
and um, then uh, you know he Arthur decided to retire rather than risk the Navy losing that position to the to an officer of another service, and then the backlash it was against Chief of Naval Operations Border because people felt that he had not stood up for Admiral Arthur. And it was vicious. It was really vicious. Um, so that's the, that was the prevailing context when they decided to just dump women <laughs> onto these carriers. You know, with the, with the surface warfare program, the women in ships, they had workshops. They had developed this whole program to smooth the transition. But here it's, you know, it's almost I'm trying to figure out a way to say this without saying bad words. Well, anyway, the, the <laughs> you know, the senator's like, well, we don't trust the Navy, you know, to to be honest about anything after Taylor, tail hook. So if you don't do what I want, then, you know, we're just going to take these women and put them on our carriers, which does is not doing favors for the pilot. So mm -hmm. I can't even imagine that, the, you know, the stress that must, you know, because of the, the, the just the resentment. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, uh, the two, two of the carriers that were out there, um, I think it was the Lincoln, they had eight women, four of them ended up leaving before the end of the tours. The Eisenhower had 10, and nine of the women completed their tours. So it could have been a function of command climate, too. But it couldn't have been easy for anybody. Um, no. And it's inter yeah, it's interesting because uh, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum magazine just recently did an article about the first women um, to fly in 1994, who had kept their names out of the press until, you know, very recent, like when the Smithsonian decided to print this article. And I can fully understand why. Um, I don't know if they say, I don't think they discuss that aspect specifically, but I'm sure it, it probably um, encouraged them to keep a very low profile. Mm-hmm. So, it sure was yeah. a rocky road from um, 1917 all the way, as you can see from what you're saying, to the 1990s. This right. is still a, um, it's it's kind of a uh, fits and starts, um, obstacles, roadblocks, and um, but the Navy certainly now in 2024 has come a long, long way, has it not? I mean, yeah. clearly well, things I have. Think Improved even since the 90s to a, a market. Well, I think that, that was really a um, a breaking point in the sense that the Navy, Navy leadership finally recognized that we have, it's a culture problem. You know, the stuff that just keeps, when stuff keeps happening, 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 happen, you can't just say, well, that's a one-off. Um, you know, there was a there was a problem endemic to the Navy's culture. And there are people who will still fight fight you on that today. But once they recognize that, they could they could take steps to address it. But it was raising that level of consciousness, you know, that had to happen and it was a very painful process. Yeah. Growing pains, we should call yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that just shows how history is the long story of the road from then to here and all the stops along the way. This is a, a fascinating um, look at the Navy from the 20th century to the present day through the lens of the evolution of women in the service. And uh, I commend you, Randy, on this wonderful book, and I recommend it to uh, all our listeners and viewers, From Yeomanets to Fighter Jets, A Century of Women in the U.S. Navy. Randy Gogan, thank you for joining us today. This has been very illuminating, very fascinating discussion. Thank you. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Same here. Well, that's it for us today, folks. Um, 
I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Until I join you again for another one of these podcasts, I bid you fond farewell.